Hello, Paola Malmqvist uh, here. I made the video about firefighting and science earlier and I got some comments and questions on this video, so I thought I'd make a short follow-up on that video. It is always your fire brigade that decides what routines and methods you're supposed to use. Never do anything based on what you see on social media or, or on YouTube. Also, it's the fire brigade that you're working for that is responsible for your health and safety. So it's always their routines and methods that, that you should uh, obey, obey to. Also, I would like to point out how it works, at least in Europe, Europe from a health and safety perspective. And I think it applies something like, it, like that in the rest of the world as well. Uh, if you use a tool, you're not allowed to use it in a different way than it is supposed to. Uh, and that is a safety net, because the manufacturer of a tool, uh, when I talk about this, this uh, piercing tool, for example, uh, the safety net here is that the manufacturers need to define when that tool is okay to use. Uh, and in what is situation, it's not okay to use it. Uh, also, the second safety net is your fire brigade, uh, because they are responsible for your health and safety. So they decide what tools and what methods to use, and they train you in how to use them, so everything works uh, in a safe manner. But with that said, I would like to talk about this piercing the battery. Uh, the video I made uh, was showing one example of one tool that is developed for piercing batteries and getting water where it is of good use. Uh, and it in, it's interesting uh, because even more methods are being developed right now to solve that problem of getting water into the uh, battery casing. And I think we need to be open for this kind of ide ideas and see how they work and what safety limitations they have. Uh, and again, always work in accordance with your fire brigade's instructions. But I would say we're just at the first step of learning how to put out an electric vehicle fire. Uh, and that means we need to have an open mind of, of different methods showing up. Uh, I got a question about the safety. How can it be safe when we have uh, lots of volts inside a car battery? Uh, and we put a firefighter and a nail, or we put a nail inside the battery, and a firefighter could be holding this nail. Uh, again, it's the instructions from the maker of the tool that should be used. But what happens is that in the battery we have a plus and a minus. And the danger is if the firefighter becomes a part between plus and minus. And in this case, they don't, because uh, in a building uh, fire, in a house fire, we have grounding of all electrical appliances. That means that we, uh, if we touch ground and then we touch one of the cables, that could mean we are part of the electrical circuit, which is a danger. But in this case, the car battery uh, is uh, not grounded or earthed. Uh, so what will happen is that when we uh, apply the, the nail into the battery, we will have local short circuits and local arcings within the battery. Uh, but those are not affecting the firefighter on the outside. Uh, and, and again, uh, it's the maker of the tool that needs to identify if there are any dangers with this. When talking about uh, car fires uh, in general or, or uh, electric battery vehicles uh, now as, as we're doing here, uh, I think the perspective of the person or organization suggesting a method is good to think about. Because I think car manufacturers and their battery experts, they have one perspective. They are looking at it from one burning vehicle and how to handle that in the best manner. Uh, sometimes they include a firefighter, but firefighters are not a solid group. 
there are many different perspectives from the firefighting side. If you would ask a hazmat expert, uh, for example, you will get another uh, view of the problem than you would if you asked an EMT or a fire building fire expert uh, or an extrication expert or a commanding officer. Uh, and I think when it comes to modern energy vehicles, all those perspectives are needed. Look at this example here. Uh, it's a burning car that would normally render a one engine coal. Uh, but the smoke from the burning car, if it's an electric vehicle, is toxic. It contains, among other things, hydrogen fluoride. And hydrogen fluoride, when it uh, affects people, needs a special antidote to treat them. Uh, and if it was a leaking cylinder of hydrogen fluoride, we would treat, treat this as a hazmat coal. Uh, and if we put this hazmat coal in a building, uh, we have other things that would make us have to prioritize what to do first and, and uh, what not to do. Uh, and depending on location and how the fire burns, there are different options. Uh, not one method for all situations. Uh, and sometimes those tactical options include to delay the problem. For example, I, I got a comment about flooding the battery and you should never comment the, uh, no, never flood the battery until it was uh, certain parts burned. Uh, that is a good advice if you're only looking on one single vehicle. But if we have the vehicle in a situation where it could harm other things, uh, it might be a good tactical option to flood the battery earlier. Because even if we get a two hour, in two hour we get a, a thermal runaway in the entire battery, that have bought us two hours to deal with the vehicle and deal with the other things first, and then we'll take care of that, that uh, thermal runaway later. Uh, and also, if I knew that a slow cooking battery fire, if it took, let's say, for example, 30 minutes to get up in speed, then I could do wise things during those 30 minutes to be ahead of the situation when it takes off. Uh, but that is the problem. We, we don't get that information from the car manufacturers. They say, cool the battery. Uh, if we could get information about how their batteries was burning and, and when they took off and in how many percent of the cases they, they uh, extinguished on their own, that would be great to have. And why not cool the outside? the manufacturers actually do recommend it. Uh, well, it might be of some help in some cases. I'm not saying it never works. Uh, but since car manufacturers' recommendation seems to be a lot of copy and paste, and uh, I haven't seen any science uh, where they compare a battery fire without cooling and a battery fire with cooling, except for the two I spoke about in the earlier video. And in both these cases, it did not work. Uh, also, the science about it makes me wonder if all car batteries are made in a way that cooling the exterior always work. If you Google battery pack design electric vehicles and go to the image side of it, you, you see tons of, of images uh, with different uh, battery pack designs. This is an example of one way of building a battery pack. Uh, you have the battery cells and you connect them with uh, conductive uh, lines, the plus pole and the minus pole. Uh, you place it in some kind of a fire retardant foam and maybe a container on the outside of, of that foam. You place several of those modules uh, together and you place them in a, in a compartment, which in total is what we call the battery pack. Uh, below the battery pack to protect from uh, damage from the road, uh, you can place a protective casing on the outside. 
I would like to talk a little bit more about the fire within this example battery uh, pack. If we have a battery fire uh, and one cell is ignited, uh, then we will get a space where we will have hot gases. Let's say they have 900 degrees C centigrade, uh, and the critical temperature of the other uh, battery cells is 180 centigrade. Uh, we will have uh, some heat transfer through conduction of the uh, wires between the poles that goes up to the batteries. Uh, we will have hot gases within the, the space and that will affect the, the fire retardant foam and the other battery cells. We will also have that hot gases affect the conducting wire on the top of the batteries. Uh, we will have hot smoke that travels within the battery and first within the battery module and when the pressure is high enough or the uh, there is a vent opening that will go to the outside of the uh, battery modules into the battery pack uh, and all of that will affect and radiate and convect heat back to the, the uh, to increase the temperatures in the battery pack. Uh, we will have that smoke traveling to the outside of the uh, battery modules on all sides, since there are air on those sides. And all of that and will transfer energy both into the batteries and to the outside of the battery casing. Uh, and there will also be smoke and hot gases eventually when the pressure buildup in the battery pack is high enough it will ventilate, or if there are ventilation openings from, from the start, that will bring energy to the outside of the, out of the battery pack. Uh, and this thing, are we supposed to cool with water on the outside? And, and this is what I'm skeptical about. There is so much heat transfer within the battery that, that I don't think cooling the outside always will be a good method. So if we look at this in more detail, we, we have water. In this case, I'm, I'm uh, spraying it on the protective casing. There might be cases when we, you can get uh, water on the battery uh, casing directly. Uh, but just to show the different uh, numbers of heat transfer, there, first we need to get that cooling of the water to the inside of the, the uh, protective casing. And that might not be so hard if it's a metal casing. If it's a composite or, or something else, then we have a, quite a bit of insulation there. Then we uh, need to have this travel through that void and, and uh, onto the, the surface of the outer casing of the battery. Uh, and that takes a lot of convection to get any uh, effect of that. Then it should travel through that casing and into the next void, where we again need to, to uh, have it convect. Uh, that is, the, the air within that void needs to first be cooled from the surface on the one side and then transfer that uh, cooling to the surface of the other side. And then again, some, some heat transfer. Uh, and if all those compartments are metals, uh, we also need to know that the metal in itself is a very good heat absorber. It, it will conduct heat and, and spread it on, on to itself. So it's, it's a good cooling. Uh, so it's not necessarily the water on the outside of the protective casing that is uh, in the beginning of a fire uh, keeping it cool. It might very well be the protective casing of the different uh, protective layers that help to cool the, the total of the batteries. Then it needs to travel through uh, whatever there are, if it's a cooling system or if it's a, a fire retardant foam or whatever it is, uh, before it finally reaches the battery. So this is the reason why I'm, I'm a little skeptical about always cooling the batteries. There are so many 
insulating layers between the battery and the, the water that we apply. And the, the question, you, I might have already answered it, but it is, uh, why is this important? Why not just cool all the time? If it works, it works. Well, if cooling doesn't work or work with varying results, then there are many options that might be better options. Uh, in the beginning of an operation, before you have started the pumps uh, and the hoses are laid on the ground, it is easier to decide what to do than to change that decision if the new decision includes other tools. Uh, also, new fire retardants in battery modules slow down speed of spread of a thermal runaway between cells and sometimes stop the propagation fully. If, if it is that way, we can use that time uh, in a better way than cooling the exterior. And maybe cooling the exterior works good after 30 minutes, then we should know that. Because if we know all those details, that will give us a window of opportunity when we can do other things that might work uh, well. Good to start thinking new. We, we, we can develop new tools and new methods if we knew that we have uh, a window of opportunity. For example, if, if we, we know that we have 30 minute, minutes to do something, in a garage fire before it takes off. Maybe we should develop tools so that we can move cars easily within that garage. Uh, and the point I would, would like to make is that we need more knowledge from the car manufacturers. Uh, because I, I know that there is a lot of science in their drawers, uh, probably in their top secret drawers. Uh, and if we knew that we could make good routines and good instructions, uh, but since they only share cool the outside of the battery, uh, we, we can't do those good decisions and, and make those good instructions. For example, I would love to see the heat release rate over time with exterior cooling compared to heat release rate over time without exterior cooling uh, and temperature probes on battery cells within the battery and see when in time the exterior cooling makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. Uh, also, I would like to see temperature in battery pack over time when the car interior is burning because that could tell us something about how much time we have from we get there until we need to worry about the, the battery pack. So there's a lot of science we would benefit from having. And I assume and I think that they are in the manufacturer's secret drawers, because if they are not, how could they then say that we should cool the outside of the battery? Uh, and that was all for me for this time. Thank you for listening. It was. Maybe a little bit long and stuttering, but uh, hey, have a Merry Christmas and uh, everything. Bye-bye.